Great, we have a really nice crowd joining us this morning, so we thank you all for your time. And um, we'd like to welcome you on behalf of Smurfit Executive Development to today's webinar on the topic of governing in times of crisis with our colleague, Professor Neve Brennan. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by Neve today. Um, Neve is the Michael McCormack Professor of Management at UCD and the founder and academic director of the UCD Centre for Corporate Governance. Um, she is a chartered accountant with KPMG and holds a PhD from the University of Warwick and is a chartered director of the Institute of Directors in London, an inaugural honorary fellow of the Institute of Directors in Ireland and an honorary fellow of the Society of Actuaries in Ireland. She has held visiting academic positions in uh, New Zealand and Australia. And just last month, uh, Professor Brennan was admitted as a member to the Royal Irish Academy and membership is by election and considered to be the highest academic honour in Ireland. Neve has published extensively on corporate governance and financial reporting. And I know certainly uh, my team and my colleagues have the pleasure of working with Neve and her colleagues on the UCD Diploma in Corporate Governance that we run every year in September. And I'll just mention a few words at the end of this webinar. So for those that have just joined us in the last few moments, Neve is going to take us through a really informative and interesting webinar for about 35 to 40 minutes. And we'll ask some questions or we'll invite you to put some questions in the chat feature at the bottom of your screen throughout the session. And we'll pick some of those um, towards the end of the webinar and we'll respond afterwards with as many answers as we can to those of you that ask the questions. Um, the speaker view is best. So if you are looking for the best feature to watch this webinar in if you pop it into speaker view mode that is um, the best resolution. So without further ado I'll hand over to Neve and thank you again for joining us this morning. Thanks very much Caroline and um, good morning to everyone attending this webinar and thanks very much for your attendance and I really really wish that I was in the executive education in Smurfit School and that I was talking to you face to face, but the government has told us we're not allowed out for the moment. So governing in times of crisis, um, I'm just going to pick up a few topical events. So this one um, with some fairly colourful imagery uh, relates to eBay and um, six ex senior executives in eBay decided to send uh, a bloody pig mask, um, live cockroaches, a funeral wreath, pornography to the next door neighbour addressed to uh, the couple that they were trying to um, impugn. And the couple live in the back end of nowhere in America and they have a blog and they wrote some negative commentary in the blog. Uh, about eBay, uh, particularly highlighting the chief executive's remuneration. So the six executives decided that they were going to get this couple. And it really is astonishing that six people in a company would think to do such a thing. And it makes me wonder, what is it in companies that kind of infects people's brains in this way. These six people were possibly, um, are possibly quite upstanding citizen, citizens outside the company. Anyway, from a corporate governance point of view, in my opinion, this is a very good story. And the reason I think it's good is because in August 2019, the police contacted the company to tell them uh, of what they thought was happening and by September one month later the six executives and the chief executive left the company so I'm impressed by the speed at which the board reacted um, it's a good news story from a from a board of directors perspective obviously from an executive perspective it's a very bad news story but the executives have been sanctioned now my next little crisis um, this is just the most unbelievable story. The company uh, went into uh, administration yesterday because 1.9 billion has gone missing. And what's fantastic about this uh, crisis case is it is so typical of corporate governance crises because so many of the checks and balances did not work at the same time. And it started with a whistleblower and the company ignored the whistleblower. The Financial Times didn't and have been running stories on this company for the last 18 months. Um, the fraud goes back a decade. 
The chief executive is the founder CEO and he is the longest serving chief executive of da the DAX 30 companies uh, on which Wirecard is listed or was listed, is the longest serving CEO. Um, the accounting fraud is so basic that it is astonishing that it could happen. But um, three people, um, I don't know the names of them, but one of them shares an office with a, tour, a bus tour company in Manila. And the three of them would produce Excel spreadsheets into Wirecard head office. And the numbers on the Excel spreadsheets were then recorded in the accounting records of Wirecard. I mean, it's beyond belief. And it would appear that those numbers were completely fictitious. But how a company of that size could allow um, such a process and how such a process could be considered appropriate by the auditors is astonishing. When the Financial Times began to write about the company, a whole load of fund managers, their response was to invest massive funds into the company. And there's a big question mark over why they did that. And of course, it wasn't their money. It was um, their clients money that they were put, uh, putting a huge bet on this uh, company. But why were they doing it? The, supervi the supervisory board, and this is a German company, so uh, it has a two-tier board structure. And of course, it's an interesting question. Um, are, are, what, are unitary boards better than dual two-tier boards like Wirecard? And um, that's just a, a, a question I will leave with you. Um, but if you come on the UCD Diploma in Corporate Governance, you might find out a bit more about that. Um, so this is a crisis that has led to the company's demise um, because all of the corporate governance checks and balances, so many of them didn't work at the same time. Now, moving on to COVID, and by the way, um, uh, it's, a, it's going to be a question in pub quizzes, and I leave the question with you to research on the internet, but what does the acronym stand for? Um, a lot of people don't know that. But anyway, how should a board be operating in a time of crisis such as what we have at the moment? And I came across this publication, uh, Deloitte publication, and the title of it, would suggest what Deloitte thinks the board should be doing, which is stepping in. And um, Deloitte's report says that the board should be active in the right way. Deloitte says that stepping in is a must and stepping aside is not an option. But it still kind of raises the question in my mind, which is when should the board step in? When should the board intervene? Another topic in the Deloitte report is succession. And the reason why succession is so emphasized is because of course the risk that some of the senior managers, the CEO might catch COVID. And has the company got the appropriate succession plans in place to cope with um, such a possibility. There's um, material in the report about when should the board meet. A big emphasis is communication with shareholders if you're a listed company and probably if, even if you're a private company. So a big part of the role of the board is communication. Deloitte emphasised the role of the chair. Um, and I thought one thing, I really liked one comment in the report, because, which is most governance happens outside the board meeting. There's a lot of preparation outside the board meeting um, to ensure that the board meetings themselves go well. And the Deloitte report refers to chair non-executive director check-ins and the importance of those regular check-ins. But I would go as far as to say those kind of check-ins uh, should be happening even in routine circumstances because they really do help to improve the chemistry around a boardroom table. Um, and then the report, the Deloitte report ends with, you know, what, how is the board to approach coming out of uh, COVID-19? I attended a recent webinar and here are a few quotes um, 
from a household name in the Irish business community. Uh, you'd all recognize his name uh, if I said it. Um, he's hugely experienced in governance terms, both at chair and non-executive director level. And I'm going to pause now and ask you a question. What do you think of what that person said? And um, I'll just kind of tell you uh, my reaction to it. On the one hand, there's some compelling language there that on the face of it makes sense. But on the other hand, I'm wondering whether those words describe a passive board or an active board. And the words in a way are a little bit in contrast with um, the Deloitte uh, comment that stepping in is essential, stepping aside is not an option. Um, moving on, um, I uh, have spent lockdown um, working on a COVID-19 project um, and uh, what we did, myself and two colleagues did, was we collected 428 trading statements and from those we ext extracted 164 um, profit warnings. Um, and um, we start the paper um, opening it by saying this is a life and death context and here is a quote from one of the trading statements that we looked at. Another question. What do you think of the tone of that statement? I think it comes across actually very sincerely compared, and it comes across well compared with some of the unbelievable guff that I've read in some of the other trading statements which don't come across as sincere at all. Anyway, back to corporate governance. Um, um, corporate governance comprises a kind of set of moving parts of internal and external governance mechanisms. And one external mechanism is uh, regulation. And the Financial Reporting Council is in charge of regulation in the UK. And largely speaking, we have um, similar kind of regulation um, in Ireland. And an internal, so the regulator is an external mechanism of governance. And an internal mechanism of governance is um, financial reporting and the associated word uh, transparency. But um, back to our profit warning paper, the Financial Reporting Council in charge of regulating financial reporting was caught completely on the back foot by COVID. There was no regulatory guidance on how to communicate um, earnings guidance to investors. Um, and as Deloitte has said, communication to shareholders is absolutely um, critical. And so in March and April, the regulators scrambled scrambled to fill a regulatory vacuum, arguably of their own making. And a slew of guidance came out from a numerous, uh, various regulators, the SEC in the US, uh, the FRC in the UK, etc. And the infographic on the screen summarizes kind of uh, some of the regulations or some of the advice that the FRC was giving to companies about guidance to their shareholders during um, COVID-19. I'll just point out one thing about that infographic that drives me insane, that if you look at the top right-hand corner, you'll see the little financial reporting lab, lab as in laboratory. Financial reporting is not a science. And I find the linguistic psychobabble of using a word like laboratory in the context of financial reporting, it's just so completely misleading, but it's typical of the psychobabble in the business world. Anyway, I'd like to know about the science of financial reporting in the case of Wirecard. 
It's not a science, it's a social science. And once you put human beings into uh, activities, things kind of happen. But anyway, one of the purposes of financial reporting is to reduce what's called information asymmetry between investors and company managers. Managers know everything about what's going on in their company and investors know relatively little. Generally, what they know is through financial reporting processes. And information asymmetry is likely to be higher during periods of uncertainty. And you would expect, given the heightened information asymmetry, that investors would receive enhanced disclosures from companies. But in our profit warning study, we found an astonishing more than 50% of the companies regressed to silence. Um, they, many of them just declined to provide any guidance whatsoever on the grounds that it was too uncertain. But surely those grounds would suggest that the guidance was imperative. Um, and the guidance could be qualified uh, with assumptions, etc. Um, and it also raises some serious questions about where it leaves market abuse regulations with companies regressing to silence. So here is an example of a regress to silence. And the wording in this example is very typical. It is too early to provide earnings guidance. And this is from a company, Associated British Foods. Many of you will work that out from the reference to Primark. Um, and in fairness to Associated British Food, um, it, it produced exactly one week later um, another trading update which contained a profit warning. Um, so I would say this is an example of a company that really was doing its best to do the right thing by its shareholders. Um, another aspect of the profit warnings was that we could see that companies were copying each other's language. And this is one um, phrase that popped up quite a few times. It would warm the cockles of your heart this phrase, voluntary salary sacrifice. Um, and here is an example of a voluntary uh, salary sacrifice. And um, it, the phrase suggests the company is doing something really worthy and worthwhile. But then you look more closely and you see that at the same time, they are um, rewarding the voluntary salary sacrifices with stock options. And since the market price of most company shares is very low at the moment, those stock options could turn out uh, to be far from a sacrifice. So again, it's the kind of linguistic manipulation that goes on that, I, uh, that disturbs me. Okay, so that's a little bit about COVID-19 and financial reporting. And it's a bit self-serving on my part because it's about my own uh, academic project. And of course, academics love talking about their own projects. Another um, aspect of COVID-19 um, for directors is the risk, the high, very heightened risk that their company might be uh, facing insolvency. And that raises a question kind of pause at this question, which is, if you are a company director, do you try and keep the company going through this crisis, or do you uh, go into insolvency? The problem from a director's point of view is the risk that a regulator will come along afterwards and will accuse a director of having, of having engaged in reckless trading, having continued to trade without being able, knowing, knowingly continuing to trade uh, without being able to pay the company's debts. And of course, as companies approach insolvency, the shareholder uh, moves aside and directors have a particular duty to the interests of creditors. Um, so the directors' duties uh, um, shift. And if you are a company director in such a situation, you're probably a little bit scared personally that 
if the company goes into liquidation, uh, you will have a very, very black mark on your CV. The Office of the Director of Corporate Enforcement has issued guidance on this topic. And um, the situation is when a company goes into liquidation, the liquidator has to file a report with the Office of Director of Corporate Enforcement, who then decides whether to um, allow the liquidator not to take it further. And if the liquidator takes it further, that means the liquidator applies to the High Court to have the directors uh, restricted. Um, and um, the guidance from the Office of the Director of Corporate Enforcement says that if you act, act honestly and responsibly, you have nothing to worry about. Um, I've written a case study on uh, such an event uh, where the, a liquidator applied to the High Court to have the directors of Pierce Contracting uh, restricted. And um, I'm not going to tell you what's going to, what happened next. You'll have to come on the UCD Diploma in Corporate Governance to find out the um, end of that particular story. And um, just to finish off uh, my part of the session, um, just to talk to you a little bit about the Diploma in Corporate Governance and the kind of approach we take to corporate governance. A lot of people approach corporate governance solely from a regulatory perspective. It's all about the rules and regulations, laws, codes of governance, best practice, etc. But to me, that rarely explains collapses such as the Wirecard collapse. And so we have a very big element of the program comprises behavioral and psychological issues. And um, the Financial Times is covering this story very, very closely because um, it has been writing about it for 18 months, um, using the material from the whistleblower uh, to write articles about Wirecard. And um, I think the next uh, slew of articles from the Financial Times will address the psychological and behavioural issues. For example, what was the personality of the CEO that um, got so many people to turn a blind eye to the most unbelievably basic um, financial reporting fraud? Uh, the Financial Times hasn't said much about the work hard board. So what was the psychological issues at play around that? The Financial Times has been covering the regulator and if it's it's in some respects similar to the Irish financial uh, regulator um, um, during the global financial crisis and um, the financial regulator was found wanting because of the green jersey and I feel that the German regulator had the German jersey whatever that color is and just did not do its job um, because it was in, in because because of a German behavioural and psychological issue at play. So the, the the UCD diploma in corporate governance tries to capture not just the rules and regulation, but the complexity uh, that entails uh, corporate governance. Um, and this is just the end of um, my section of this webinar, and I thank you very much for listening to me. Um, but the intention is that the programme will be, to the greatest extent possible, be um, business as usual, obviously taking care of personal safety issues and all the rest, but that it will be delivered face to face. Because one of the unique features of executive education is learning from each other, students learning from each other, and not just from the lecturer. So online delivery um, doesn't can't capture um, that kind of peer-to-peer -peer learning in the way that face-to-face -face experience can. Um, so thank you very much uh, again for listening to me, and I hope you found what I, the few comments um, a little bit interesting. 
Thank you, Neve. Um, we have some questions in. Um, if you don't mind, I'll just spring them upon you now. Uh, we have a great question from a fellow faculty member and alumni of the program, Dr. Margaret Cullen. So um, ESG, which I am wondering, is that the environmental social governance um, is very in vogue. Do you believe that companies have a clear view on the components to ESG, particularly the S element? Um, I, I'm, I'm a little bit, I've come across um, companies trying to make it look as if they're into ESG, but I wonder to what extent is it genuine or is it just trying to create an impression? For example, in the US, a group of very, very senior CEOs signed up, about 180 of them signed up to a statement from, I think it's called the Business Roundtable. But it turns out, and this is another paper that I have this in, it turns out that six of the CEOs signing up to this statement are CEOs of the top 20 fossil fuel emitters in the world. So on the one hand, they're signing up to a statement say, which is basically confirming their commitment to ESG. And on the other hand, they're running businesses that are, di that are the absolute um, antithesis of ESG. Um, so are they going through the motions, the performativity of governance when they sign up to such a statement or do they really mean it? Okay, thank you. Um, we have another question in here, um, uh, a former um, alumni as well, Sean Quigley. Um, how do you feel boards can best engage with management during this crisis? Um, unfortunately, I, I'm a bit like Sean. I, I have more questions than I have answers. And again, I go back to the little uh, comments on uh, the quote from the uh, governance expert uh, that I quoted earlier, um, you know, I mean, if you're a manager running, if you're the CEO running a, COVID, a company in COVID-19, I imagine it's a complete nightmare. And I just don't know um, whether having complete calm in the boardroom and the board, so to speak, stepping back and letting management do their job I just don't know whether that's the right approach or whether the board should be maybe more engaged in a time of crisis than uh, in a business as usual type context. So, Sean, I mean, this is the thing I find the hardest myself about governance, which is how should you behave around a boardroom table? What should you do to be a good non-executive director? You're meant to be challenging. Uh, how do you ask challenging questions? I, I really wish I knew more about that myself. Um, but if I was looking for answers, um, I would be looking in the behavioral and psychology literature and definitely not in codes of governance and best practice. Okay. And this might lead on. Um, we have a question here. When you know the two shareholders of a privately owned firm that you work for are trading recklessly at a potential detriment of the business, how do you manage that situation as a senior manager? Well, um, the question is a little bit confused because it, it implies, uh, I'm assuming that the two shareholders are also involved in management of the business. Because if they're just shareholders, um, you know, uh, they can't be, a shareholder is external to a company and therefore cannot be recklessly trading. So the two shareholders, they're probably directors as well as being the major shareholders, and maybe they're not making uh, the right call um, at a board level. And I, for the for the manager who is concerned, um, I think I would suggest to that manager to get professional advice, mm -hmm. because for that manager you need to protect yourself, and you need need to make sure that you know um, the steps that you you know I do, I do things like for example I would make certain that your concerns were recorded in writing. If they can be recorded in writing in board minutes, that's the best, but even in private correspondence, because I think that individual manager has to protect themselves from being accused of behaving inappropriately after the horse is bolted, so to speak. 
Okay. We do have time if, if you'd like, we can ask, there's lots of questions here. So, I mean, we could take two more if you're happy to continue. Yep. Okay, so we have a question here. How important is GRI assurance in sustainability reporting? Um, I can't remember now what the acronym for GRI stands for, but I know what it is. Um, and GRI is one again of these kind of um, environmental and social uh, reporting uh, mechanisms. And um, um, again, I, I, I give the same answer, which is I never know whether complying with GRI guidelines is um, window dressing or is it, is it a genuine substantive uh, engagement. I would say for some companies it's window dressing, for other companies it's genuine. Um, so, uh, but I, I suppose I'll finish off by saying that the research is coming out quite strongly, suggesting that uh, companies that engage substantively in, uh, in environmental and social uh, reporting and uh, management issues, that they perform better. Okay. I think uh, you've kindly agreed to collate, uh, with the help of our team, some answers to those questions that we didn't get to this morning. So we'll work on that over the next few days and share those answers with a copy of this recording for those that might want to replay it or share it with colleagues amongst their own team. Um, maybe we'll just touch upon very briefly the September intake um, that we're recruiting for at the moment. Um, if you wouldn't mind just moving the slide on a notch. There we go. So myself and my colleagues within the executive development team were accepting applications and as Neve pointed out we're taking all precautions um, that we can to bring people back to campus to experience the program as it has run over the last uh, 15 to 16 intakes. Um, my colleague Maria is on the line and she's there in front of us. Um, Maria is um, accepting applications right now and um, the cutoff date is the end of the first week in August, um, so that we can prep for your return on the September 7th start date. Um, there's just one more slide, Neve, that you might just move along there and I'll just speak briefly to it. So the next steps, if you're interested in hearing more, you need to contact Maria at maria.keeney at ucd.ie. Maria will have a conversation with you just to make sure that you're aware of how the program is structured. So it's two 12-week semesters, Monday and Tuesday evenings for the most part, between 4.30 and 7.30 p.m. on our campus in Black Rock. We have dedicated facilities for executive development participants. Uh, Marie will ask and work with you to fill out the application form and to collect all the ancillary documents like uh, previous transcripts if you're not a UCD graduate. The fees are 15325 for those that are not a UCD alum. And of course, especially during these times also, we will work with um, every participant to make sure that an installment plan can be set up to make it easy for people to pay their tuition fees over the lifetime of the programme. So it starts in September and the last um, session is in May when we complete the programme with um, uh, two two-hour exams. So there's two two-hour exams in December and in May. All your materials are provided for you. We have a wonderful dedicated programme manager, Siobhan Lane Walsh, and Siobhan's been working on this program tirelessly and knows all the ins and outs and will hold your hand throughout the entire experience to make sure that you have all the materials that you need and the weekends away are organized and the library access and all of the extra um, bits and pieces that accompany the program outside of the classroom. Um, we would ask people that if you are interested in finding out more to get your application in or at least make your inquiry with Maria as soon as possible because we are reducing um, the capacity in the classrooms to adhere to social distancing. So really, please don't put it on the long finger is our advice so that we can make sure that we can get you a spot um, if you'd like to proceed. Um, and that's really a whistle-stop tour of the, the programme. We can provide you with lots of information if you'd like to find out and we can have one-to-one -one calls with you. Um, but other than that, for this morning, we'd just like to take this time to thank you and to thank Neve uh, in particular for the, the time and effort you put into preparing for this webinar and for all of you joining us. And uh, we have more webinars coming in the series. Um, the next one is next week, so we will send out some details uh, because it might be relevant for a member of your team, a colleague, a family uh, member or somebody in your network. So you might help us spread the word. So thank you again. And um, we'll end the webinar now. Uh, have a good weekend.